I started being a police officer nearly 26 years ago, so almost a lifetime ago for some people, and I've done the majority of my service on the CID. Stepped back to uniform a couple of times, but generally speaking, I consider myself to be a detective. It means a great deal to me. When I started, you had a notebook with a pen. I still carry a notebook with a pen because it never lets you down. But you've got to try and keep pace and keep across all these new technological challenges. Uh, not always easy, but that's why I have um, the team that I have. Generally speaking, there are two really important strands. Digital media and CCTV. Invariably, that's real data. It's real time, hard data that is usually incontrovertible. It's there and it speaks for itself. What can those two strands tell me? Digital media is a fairly new innovation, really, for the major incident resource. With Gracie, with other young in-service officers, they bring energy, they bring enthusiasm. She's also an extremely valued member of the team. My father is a retired police officer now, so it's something I was very passionate about, and I've been in the force since I was 19 years old. My role is to come in from a digital perspective. What I like is the freedom of being able to push boundaries and try and find where people have slipped up. Nowadays, when something goes wrong, what do we do as humans? We go to our phone. So if something bad's happened, the first thing we do is ring somebody, text somebody, delete everything on our phone. People's lives are on the devices. Their device will give everything away. It's like the diary. Preston. It's intense every day, we'll have something going on. The melting pot of cultures as well makes it so diverse and so much more richer and it's a lot more welcoming than other cities. Just before Christmas 2020, the major incident team launched Operation Aspen after a teenager was brutally stabbed. There was a 999 call summoning emergency services just by the football club of Preston North End. Keep going, keep going, taking the next right by that Heights and Medical Centre. A distressed female saying that a young male had been stabbed in the property. It sounded chaotic. All you can hear is shouting and screaming. 9-4, can make your um, m away where we're there and they can meet us. Right here. At the same time, another phone call came in from a male Within that, he says that two unknown males have entered the property and attacked a 16-year-old boy. The uniformed police officers saw a young boy basically bleeding out on the floor. You can see the terror in his eyes. Yeah, male's got several stab wounds to his leg and uh, for one in his chest. NWAS on scene at the moment. We'll update you further shortly. The victim was Surmad Al Saidi, a 16 year old who had gone round to play video games with his friends. Paramedics arrive and perform um, medical interventions. They had opened his chest, massaged his heart in attempts to keep his heart going. With medics on the scene, the police quickly began to gather evidence from the homeowner who had made the 999 call and the three teenage friends who had witnessed the attack. Right, so they're all playing on the PlayStation and these two these two lads have run in. They've just walked in. Did it happen here? Yeah, it yeah, happened I think here. in there where that blood is. Right, OK. Yeah, the two lads ran through. Right. Um, they've gone directly to him. Um, there's been lots of other people pushing and shoving yeah. they wanted him. Right. And it's happened just there at the back? Just there, just there. What, inside or outside? No, no, inside, inside. They were all playing on the PlayStation. Right. There were nothing, no aggro, no talking, no right. nothing. We were even talking about bringing dinner. Unknown assailants had burst into this address. The victim was singled out immediately. Clearly they knew who the victim was and the first assailant stepped forward and he began to slash um, with a knife that was described by the witnesses as a pirate knife, actually, like a cutlass. And then the second male joined in and he was more deliberate uh, in stabbing, making a stabbing motion and he had what was described as a zombie knife. Got somebody dressed in a black hoodie. Yeah. Yeah, the man had on. Yeah. I would say he was um, 
I'm five foot five. I would say he's about six, five, nine, five, eleven, five, ten. They both had balaclavas on. One showed more of the eyes than the other. They believe one male was possibly white. The other one they couldn't tell. The two suspects ran off within seconds of the attack, leaving the other teenage boys who had been playing video games traumatised. The, the boys, two of them particularly, were just very clearly distressed and upset and just all they were worried about was the victim and if he was going to be OK. I didn't see him. The other witness just said more or less that he hadn't really seen anything and that he just wanted to make sure Sarmad was OK but wasn't as informative as the two other individuals that were in the property. As the victim, Sir Mad, was rushed to hospital with life-threatening injuries, DCI Wilson immediately pulled together a team to investigate. That was working really from the off on this case, and Christmas was cancelled that year for a lot of the staff. You know, it's just, uh, that's policing for you. Uh, it's happened and it needs to be dealt with. Our concern is, what is their next stage now? Is anybody else at risk? Are they going to put others at risk? Because we've got two unknown males in the local area running around with one large machete and one large hunting knife that have caused such ferocious injuries to a 16-year-old child and we don't know where they are, who they are and how we're going to get them. The investigators turned first to CCTV from a nearby property just before the stabbing happened. You start to see two males, similar build, dressed in dark clothing with what appears to be large objects which keep being pulled and put away constantly. We saw the knives produced. They'd been in the vicinity for 40 minutes. Are they waiting for some sort of signal? Are they waiting for the victim to arrive? Do they truly know he's in there? Just going back and forth from the driveway of where the offence took place. You then get that absolute nailed piece of time where they disappear from view. And then they come out running. Well, you know that's the time of the attack, down to the second. You can see the direction that they're fleeing, but the weather was poor, the quality wasn't the best, um, so you couldn't identify them from that CCTV. The team still had very little to go on. Due to the type of attack, the violence used, and the victim being so young, it really impacted the local press and area. A lot of people in the community were troubled and upset over this incident, so wanted to help in any way they could. A public appeal for information turned up the names of two possible suspects. They were both well-known to police previously, and, crucially, uh, they both knew the victim. One day later, on Christmas Eve, 16-year-old Lamar Forbes was arrested at home. And later on that day, 18-year-old Jamie Dixon decided to hand himself in. Both had known Sir Mad from school. Uh, I've got Jamie Dixon outside the police station. What were you arrested for? I'm going to tell you in a second, man. You were under arrest on suspicion of attempted murder. Okay. You don't have to say anything about harm in your face. You don't make sure you're questioned anything. You're trying to have a court. Attempted murder. It's not a small child, is it? See ya. I'm just going to start by asking you did you try to kill Al Saidi on Wednesday, the 23rd of December 2020? No comment. Is there any reason that you would have committed this offence? Why would I stab someone up on Christmas Eve when I want to open my presents and go see my mum? You know what I mean? Come on, logic. Okay. The main thing was, were they where they said they were? Both claiming they were at the home address, nothing to do with the incident. Both um, on their arrest had no phones on them, which was unusual. The police had no motive and no real evidence but a search of Lamar Forbes' home had turned up missing mobiles. Digital investigator Gracie set about the painstaking work of recovering any evidence that would connect them to the stabbing. I can identify from call records, rough locations they've been in, if they've used Wi-Fi in certain areas. 
one individual his phone, placed him in that location because the only way he could use that cell to get his coverage, his network, was to be in the vicinity of our offence location in Preston. And she could tell who he was in contact with. There believed to have been a phone call made in the conservatory at the time, just prior to the offence. It's lots of things like this that start to build up and show that actually they got inside knowledge. One of the teenagers, Hussein, who had claimed his innocence, was also clearly implicated in the attack. And CCTV from the night deepened their suspicions. We have two suspects in the corner, and our other suspect walks across with like a form of acknowledgement to them being there. Then within a matter of minutes, this phone call between our suspects in the conservatory has taken place and then the attack on our victim is initiated at that point within a matter of seconds. I'm pretty confident he gave a signal to those two waiting outside to come in. He was arrested in the early morning of the 25th of December on Christmas Day. At this time, you're under arrest on suspicion of conspiracy to commit murder. You do not have to say anything, but it may harm your defence if you do not mention when questioned something you later rely on in court. Can you just say your full name for me? That's what I said. Would you describe you as really good friends? Are you close? No, good. Like the other two suspects, 17-year-old Hussein was giving nothing away. The team needed a break in the case. It was the morning of the 26th where a chap went to clean his teeth and happened to notice on a lean-to just under his bathroom window there was a pirate knife type cutlass on the roof. This is what's been described as more of a pirate sword. Actually, as you can see, it's clearly more of a machete, but it perfectly matches the description. The weapon was discarded because they didn't want to be stopped by the police in possession of a weapon. So they decided to get rid of it not very far from the attack site at all. It was literally around the first corner. But after forensic examination, the only DNA found on the knife belonged to the victim. Four days after the attack, there was worse news to come from the hospital. Unfortunately, on the 27th of December 2020, our victim died at 16 years of age, surrounded by his family. They loved him dearly. Um, he was the absolute apple of their eye, is how I would describe it. They never got to speak to their son again, which is a terrible, terrible thing. At this point, the investigation then turned into a Category A murder investigation of a child. As a result, there's even more pressure on now. The police were convinced they had the killers, but they still needed the evidence to get a conviction. So the team continued to trawl through hours of CCTV from the local area. We started to track down actual locations the suspects had gone prior to the offence. One in particular, a local shop, where one suspect has his face clearly on show, purchasing energy drinks prior to the attack, matching the clothing of our description. CCTV also picked up the main suspects after the stabbing. One is he emerged from a house half a mile away. He came out just dressed in shorts and not wearing any shoes. CCTV is telling us he's got rid of all his clothing on, you know, a filthy night weather-wise. What a strange thing to do. The younger of the two, he went home, burnt his clothing. And from CCTV, overlooking the back of his house, you can actually see the flickering of the flames. Gracie Vincent's team were also working on the suspects' phones and focused particularly on Snapchat. Our suspects, our victim, our witnesses purely communicated off certain social media apps, in particular one which is known amongst most young people as everything disappears at once it's sent. But most things are recoverable on your smartphone. No one even knew, apart from me and my boy there, yeah, but not now. I'm spreading it half around, half away around Preston, bro. Done this, done that, bro. Come on, man, calm down, man. The guy's preaching over getting stabbed on that. No one is gassing, because no one actually gives, bro. 
the individuals audio record themselves, sending it to each other, thinking it's disappearing, saying how somebody's going to get stabbed up in a house, bro, it ain't a joke, catch our victim right about now. Our victim is in the property where the offence was, and these are all time stamped. See, I don't mind them, bro, my clothes have been burnt, bro, but I don't know what they're going to say to me, you know what I mean? Both suspects were clearly talking about the offence. Just way more jigs, it's a heavy ass charge of that if you get caught, bro. Yeah, bro, if I get nicked on this, bro, all the texts are going to come up, man. Bro, I'll get about 10 years, bro. Bro, just delete all these texts and I'll speak to you when I see you in person, bro. And our suspect, who was formerly the witness, actually did know the identity um, and had lied on his police statement saying that he didn't know who it was. So little things like that, they slowly all became undone. My man's hurt, bro. You know what I mean? I know you didn't mean for it to happen, but like, when you made that decision in anger, bro, telling them, come back, bro, just come back on all of us hard, man. Then all of a sudden the tone changes later when I think the realisation comes. Well, I mean, like, people are thinking about it, playing and playing and playing in my head, bro. Thinking about my murder as well, you know what I mean? The messages were incriminating, but one conversation retrieved from Jamie Dixon's call data was absolutely damning. He received a call from a prison establishment. I think it was five minutes after the attack. We had the elder boy who received the call boast him that he'd just stabbed an Asian kid. That was an absolute golden nugget of information and just demonstrates the power, really, of your digital media investigator. And the digital evidence just kept on coming. The police discovered a horrific video shared online by Lamar Forbes. This video was several seconds long and um, our suspect said he had stabbed our victim up with a large zombie hunting knife. This turned out to have been sent to several people in the Preston area. And this was just one of many things that this individual in particular tripped up on. Finally, the team had enough evidence to charge both Dixon and Forbes with Sir Mad's murder. And to also charge Hussein, who had claimed his innocence from the start. There is no doubt in my mind that the third suspect was brought into the plot and sent into that address. One, to confirm that the victim was there and two, to lull him into a false sense of security, that he was safe, because they'd clearly been friends at some point. And at last, a motive. It related to an incident that had taken place months earlier. There'd been a really quite serious fight in which a knife was picked up um, by our victim. That, unfortunately, cut the elder of the two offenders across his left wrist, if memory serves, caused quite a nasty laceration. And there were threats issued that I'm going to kill you for that. Presented with the evidence, Lamar Forbes pleaded guilty to murder and was jailed for life. Jamie Dixon and Assad Hussein went to trial. Found guilty of murder, Dixon also received a life sentence. And Sir Mad's supposed friend, Hussein, was sentenced to five years for conspiring to commit the assault. Getting the justice for a um, family, th that was worth every horrendous day of painstaking work and trying to make sense of what had happened. A bit sad, actually, because it's a lot of young lives ruined. All of those young men, and they've all got to live with the consequences of what they did on that night. City-based gangs set up networks of street dealers in towns and rural areas to sell their heroin, cocaine and cannabis using a dedicated mobile phone line, the County Line. There are an estimated 600 lines operating across the UK, each generating up to a million pounds a year for the criminal gangs. I've been a police officer for over 27 years. It gives me a lot of satisfaction helping the community. I do like to put bad people in prison. It's just a, a way of life, it's a vocation. We probably have the same challenges in Northampton that we have elsewhere, but one major challenge is unlawful drug supply. We're close to Birmingham, we're close to London, real big cities. We have a big population and we do seem to have a, a, a county line drugs problem in the town. In 2019, the neighbourhood's police team began to hear about a particularly violent group of dealers 
supplying drugs in the town. We had what was quite clearly a drugs gang operating in the area with a hierarchy, uh, with a leader. There was organisation. They were using a phone line, classic drug dealing. You phoned that line, you met a runner, you were provided with drugs. Louise was at the PC covering the St David's estate where this drug gang was operating. I've been a PC for eight years now. I've got a small patch that I deal with, so I know these people and you know their issues, you know their history. So it's really important, I think, to build that trust in the community. This is the St David's estate. It's in the middle of Kingsthorpe. Um, St David's, quite a deprived area. There's a lot of council houses here, um, a lot of unemployment, a lot of crime. And this is one major part of my beat area. Towards the end of 2019, a flat on PC O'Sullivan's patch was becoming a major problem. The constant intelligence that I was getting was Class A drugs, so heroin and crack cocaine, were being dealt in the Drayton Walk area. 40, 50 people were turning up daily to collect their drugs from this flat. Speaking to the residents there, I got the feeling they were scared. They were really scared. There were threats being made of assaults, rocks being thrown through people's windows. They terrorised the neighbourhood, definitely. With the fear and antisocial behaviour increasing on the estate, the neighbourhood police team set up a special operation, codenamed Eagle, to bring the gang to book. And a key player on the team was Inspector Beth Warren. I joined the police because I wanted to be able to say that I've made the lives of the community better on those estates. At the time, I was the sergeant for the area, so my role was the operational planning around uh, what we were going to do. The drug dealers routinely carried weapons. We saw people being threatened to be killed. We saw um, deployments involving machete attacks. They had a total disregard for the law. And the situation took a darker turn still. They had started to groom really vulnerable children and they were doing that because they wanted them to act as um, lookouts for them when they were doing their drug dealing activity. When I'd walk on the estate, you could hear audibly the whistles and you knew those whistles were from the children alerting the gang that we were on the estate and walking around. But over time, those children, they got them to start to handle the drugs themselves and that, and that was just awful. Worried about the exploitation of local youngsters, the team decided to try and close the drug dealing HQ in Drayton Walk. On that first warrant, a lot of the people involved were in that address and got arrested and were questioned because there was drugs, weapons, money, phones. The raid led to the arrest of gang members Kaylin Smalley, Jamie Hobbs and the gang leader, 20-year-old Cray Stewart. They were charged with possession with intent to supply but they were not remanded in custody and they were all released on bail. 24 hours later, they were back on the streets, dealing again. The intelligence kept coming in that Drayton Walk, the address was being used to deal drugs from, even after that warrant. So in March 2020, we conducted another warrant there. Are you actually sick at the minute, buddy? Again, some of the same people were there. They got arrested, they were questioned. Same thing, drugs, weapons. And when I say weapons, not just your kitchen knife, you're talking machetes, axes, things that you really wouldn't want to be coming up against in the street. But even though the team seized drugs, phones and weapons, the second raid fared no better than the first. 
The Crown Prosecution Service made the decision that the evidence was insufficient to guarantee convictions. And once again, they were released on bail. It annoyed me that the people that were involved in that flat were still going about their business in exactly the same fashion as before, from the same address, in higher frequency. The people visiting the address, it just seemed to be getting more and more. We all felt rather deflated. We put so much work into getting these warrants, building the intelligence, getting a team together. There's a lot of people involved. I was really conscious that the community see us going in, doing the warrants, and then walking away. And the next day, the gang members who we'd arrested, be charged and remanded them, had been released from court and were back on the streets. The gang stepped up the level of violence. Many in the estate were scared to leave home. People lived in fear. If they were seen or dared to be seen talking to a uniformed officer, they'd be brandished a snitch. I would get phone calls from one of the chaps that lived in the estate. He would ring me sometimes two or three times a day or more because they've threatened him, they've threatened his wife. It was awful to hear him crying down the phone every day. Two months of setbacks and the team needed a break. And it came a month later from an eagle-eyed traffic officer. I was just traveling down Spencer Bridge Road. It was the white Fiesta that pulled out and turned left, coming the opposite direction towards me that kind of got my attention. It, it didn't really stop at the junction. It literally just took off down here, doing uh, in excess of 60 mile an hour. So I've gone across and hit the 999 button, put the blue lights on. My thought process was that potentially I'm following a stolen vehicle. Drive, speed, 7 zero. I don't know if you overtake. PC Lee had no idea who was driving the car or why they were driving so dangerously. It's uh, wrong side of the island, it's still catching right out. Speed 5 0, slow risk. It's three up, uh, unknown to me. Weather conditions are fine and dry, traffic is live, just approaching the red ATS, which is my element, stand by. The vehicle is heading towards the town centre. Where uh, town centres are, they're normally you know, a lot busier. Still catching right out of town, speed 7 0, traffic's light. PC still Lee low still low had no idea why the driver was so desperate to evade him. Just approaching to where the speed camera is, just doing a few overtakes of a, a couple of vehicles. Up to medium, back down to low. So we're popping for you, sir. See where you can be popping. Yeah, going in here. Sir, uh, just approaching Morrison's to the near side, speed 6 0. So, bottom side of the road uh, is light, medium risk. Uh... The chase continued for seven miles along country roads. Uh, contact gate again. Let's go. Right, 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 right again, Darren. It's heading towards Molson now. It's eased off a little bit now. Uh, speed uh, 7 0. It's gone left, left, left. Uh, it's gone down through a no entry uh, cross street, cross street. The type of vehicle that he was in versus the one that I was in, he was going to find it extremely challenging to shake me off. One to the one-way system, uh, I believe it's the Church Street. Road conditions are light, uh, it's, got, it's still going round the one way again. He's kind of flat out along here, we're doing uh, 80, 90 mile an hour. Yeah, that's all copied, speed 9-0 in the 30, traffic is light. Little does he know that uh, around about this point, I've got uh, an officer that's at the crossroads down here uh, that sat there with a stinger uh, ready to deploy it. 
the car was finally stopped by traffic officers, but the three occupants made a run for it on foot. One of them uh, got out and ran over that way, and then the other two went garden hopping over into these premises here. At last, their identities were revealed. Gang member Caleb Smalley and Cray Stewart, believed to be the county line kingpin. With drugs and a phone found, this could be the breakthrough the investigation needed. I'd come in on duty on the 19th of April and the station was buzzing and I said, what's happened? Haven't you heard? Haven't you heard? There was a massive car chase last night involving Cray Stewart as the driver. Cray and Smalley were arrested by the traffic officers and Cray was charged with dangerous driving and possession of drugs. But he was once again released on bail. I'd see him in the community. He'd be riding his bike and he'd be goading me, goading the other officers, saying, you're never going to catch me. He knew. That's not somebody who doesn't want to be doing that. He wanted that life. That was fun for him. And I'm trying my best, and my team are trying their best. My, my supervisors are trying their best. Everyone's trying their best to make the wider community safe. But it's just getting worse. Again, they're released, and it, it all keeps going. It seemed like a Groundhog Day loop. We get the intelligence, we conduct the warrant, we find these people, we get drugs, weapons, cash, phones. The gang doesn't give a damn, and they carry on. We needed something to break the loop. The police had found a phone in the car, which they hoped might help crack the case. When that vehicle was recovered, the line phone was in there with a dealer list, a list of customers for the drugs line. This deal list was perfect for us because we could link that with names and amounts from the phones that we'd already had and downloaded. These names matched some of the people that were buying drugs from the group. With stronger evidence against them, the team started to put together plans for yet another raid on the drug dealing headquarters in Drayton Walk, one they hoped would finally put them out of business. We wanted to enforce on a Misuse of Drugs Act warrant and hopefully find them with drugs and at court hit them with the closure order as well so that if they ever did get bail, they wouldn't be able to go back to that address. In the early hours of the morning, the flat was raided and Class A drugs were found. They successfully arrested two members of the gang, but gang boss, Cray Stewart, was not there. One of the individuals had drugs on him, and one of those individuals was also the flat holder. At that time, we felt that there was a really strong case to charge and remand those two members of the gang and get them out of the way. I felt like we were getting somewhere because two of the gang were remanded in prison. I wanted Cray Stewart because he was the lead of the gang and he was still out and about. Um, the intelligence that we were getting saying that he was looking for a different address. As Cray was looking for somewhere else to deal his drugs from, the raids had provoked more violent attacks on the estate. We saw an increase in arsons, and that was the real concern for me when we started to see that crime type. We got a report from a resident on the estate that had put their washing out and someone had set fire to it. And there were children in that house, there were children in that flat. So we knew that we had to move quickly. With the situation at crisis point, the police found Cray. Cray Stewart was now using his home address, which is where he lives with his mum and dad and younger brother, to deal the drugs from. We decided to conduct several warrants at the same time for all the addresses that were coming in from people in the community to say that that gang was using these addresses to deal from. There was around 70 officers involved in the operation. Failing wasn't an option for us. We were going to get that result. Please! Please! Please, show yourself! It was the most perfect timing because he'd fallen asleep on the sofa in his living room with crack cocaine and heroin all in front of him on the coffee table. 
and he was wrapping it up. He was preparing it for sale. It's quite a bit of um, drugs here, mate. So I just keep, keep control of him. We'll then um, photograph it and then sort it. She's a warrant for the mission to drug search. All right. Let me so speak just, I'll make sure this is the No, we're taking off to custody, mate. He had his line phone for making these deals. He had cash next to him as well. So that meant that Craig then got remanded that day and he got sent to prison. I'm mum. I'm going to jail, mate. Can't they even give me a cuddle? Craig, throw it, mate. Love you, yeah? Right, love you. Actually, I'm going to jail, right? See you later. I just remember thinking, we've got him. We've got him at last. And it was a, it was a good feeling. <laughs> After two years and nine warrants, three of the gang were now behind bars. The team now faced the challenge of keeping them there. The stuff in the living room is all mine. There is more by the side of the sofa. By this point, we had Chris Stewart and Jamie Hobbs remanded in prison. We needed to make sure that we were working as fast as we could to get everything together for a court date and to bring in the rest of the people that weren't remanded to make sure that they got their prison sentence as well. Having seen the gang walk free so many times previously, Inspector Andy Blaze decided to take a bold approach to the charging. If we were to just deal with a possession with intent to supply, a one-off search seizure of supply quantity drugs, the individual might look at a two or three year sentence, or even in some cases with mitigation, a non-custodial sentence. The plan was to gather all the evidence together and prove the more serious charge of conspiracy to supply, showing that the previous charges were all connected and part of a bigger drug dealing operation. With a conspiracy, you're upping the sentencing options for the judge. And, and getting closer to the sort of 10-year mark. PC O'Sullivan was tasked with preparing the evidence to convince the CPS of this higher stakes crime, including the data from the 44 phones seized in the raids. You think this has got to be watertight? It's just about proving that. So I wanted the best result for the people that had given me that in intelligence in order to put these people away because they were causing so much harm. After two months of evidence gathering, the Crown Prosecution Service authorised the conspiracy charge against Cray Stewart, Jamie Hobbs and Caleb Smalley. Leading up to the trial, I didn't get much sleep, no. But thankfully, when all of the evidence was put to them, they decided actually, along with their defence lawyers, this case isn't worth going to trial because we're going to get longer sentences if we don't go guilty early. There's too much there. It was watertight. The investigation worked. The evidence was there. At court, Caleb Smalley was sentenced to four years. Jamie Hobbs and the gang boss, Cray Stewart, both received more than seven years each. They're not there anymore, and they're not dealing drugs, and they're not carrying weapons, and they're not exploiting children. The community itself, when we walk through it, you no longer hear the whistles to to state that we're walking about, people talk to you. Um, there's, there's still issues there, it's still a deprived part of the community, but it just feels different when you walk around. The neighbourhood is in a better place. Crime figures are much lower. That's crime and antisocial behaviour in the area. That said, the battle against drug supply in the town is, is not over. <laughs> 